This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Hey folks! So this video is a little bit different than usual. It is not part of the ongoing season. It is not canon within the universe of the show. It was actually originally written almost a year ago as one of our Nebula classes, but I changed my mind and decided to make a different class instead. That one is about how to make a movie, and it's available now. So I figured I would hold on to this and at some points just make it as a regular video here on the channel, and that's what I did. And that's why, in case you're wondering, the video seems a lot more like an academic class than most of the videos usually do. So anyway, with that explanation out of the way, enjoy my class on how to analyze movies. Hi, I'm Patrick Willems, and today I want to talk to you about movies. Or, if we want to sound fancy, we're going to be discussing cinema. Compared to other art forms like literature or painting or music that have been around for hundreds of years, cinema is relatively young. Moving picture cameras weren't invented until the late 1800s, and the first movie with recorded sound came out less than a hundred years ago, so we're still in the early days of the medium. For the past century, movies have been the most popular art form in the world. We've been watching them and enjoying them our whole lives. And for a lot of people, movies are just a fun thing to watch to kill some time. And that's fine. But maybe you want to look at them a little more deeply. I mean, if weirdos like me can get a whole college degree in something called cinema studies, there must be more going on here. And that's what this video is about. Because pretty much every movie ever made has more to it than just the surface level story. Like any art form, cinema is the result of artists making deliberate choices, and those choices influence how the movie affects us emotionally and what ideas or meanings it's expressing. We are not here to decide whether a movie is good or bad and then move on. What we're going to do here today is talk about how to interpret these aspects of a movie. The story, the shots, and editing, and how it's all put together, to understand how it works and what it all means. Now this kind of analysis doesn't just apply to cinema. We're really talking about analyzing works of art. And narrative art, like cinema, warrants the same level of serious analysis as paintings hanging in the Louvre. And folks, I am not only talking about fancy art films by Bela Tarr or Ryosuke Hamaguchi. We can apply this same level of analysis to Sonic the Hedgehog 2 or Megan. And once we're done here, you can be that insufferable, pretentious person at a party who tells everyone what movies are really about. How Lord of the Rings is actually about addiction. How Top Gun is about struggling to figure out one's sexuality. And how every Christopher Nolan movie is really about how he misses his family. I mean, that last one I actually do believe. Okay, look, I'm gonna be honest with you. You can probably turn this video off after this one chapter, because this is the only rule that really matters. If you learn this, you're pretty much set to go and start analyzing all the movies you want. So let me start with a little story. Back when I was in college, taking a lot of cinema studies courses, for a while I honestly wasn't very good at interpreting meaning from movies. I could break down technical aspects and story structure, but for some reason I was resistant to the idea of giving every element some deeper subtextual significance. And then what finally made it click for me was this art history class I took, where the professor realized that I wasn't fully getting it. So we had a meeting at the College Art Museum, and she finally got through to me by breaking it down in a way I understood. So in simplest terms, analyzing art really just comes down to two steps. 
Step one, look closely at the piece and just describe what you're seeing, what the piece is and what's happening in it. And step two, ask why. Treat every part of that piece as a choice the artist made and ask why they made that choice. What was their goal? What purpose does it serve? How does it make me, the viewer, feel? So if you're looking at a painting, you're doing this with the overall composition of the piece, the choice of colors, the size of the piece, the perspective and style of brush strokes, the degree of realism versus abstraction. All of these things should be examined and questioned. And yes, I am aware that frequently in art, you get happy accidents, things that end up in the finished work but were never a deliberate part of the artist's design. What do we make of those? Do we ignore them because of their accidental nature? Nope! Those deserve just the same level of analysis. It could even be worth analyzing how the technique used led to an environment in which this kind of accident could be possible. Because analysis does not end at what the artist intended. That's the fun thing about art. The artist gives it meaning, but so do we as viewers. We can totally say that the artist is wrong about their own work. That regardless of what they intended, it means something different. Because remember, folks, and say it with me all together now, art is subjective. And that said, it doesn't mean that I have to agree with every single take. You can tell me that, I don't know, that like, Toy Story is an allegory for Western imperialism. And if you can argue that, I would love to hear it. But also, I don't think you're gonna find a lot of evidence to present there. Okay, so now let's actually get into how we analyze a movie. I want to start in the broadest, most general way. How do we look at a movie and identify its primary themes? Movies are complicated, and there's always a lot going on, but how do we interpret what it's saying? Because look, regardless of what the movie is, good movies or bad movies, every movie is about something. Every movie has some kind of core idea it's expressing, or at least trying to express. For the rest of this video, I want to focus primarily on one movie to show you how you can take a pretty ordinary film, something that does not seem like a deep art film, and actually extract a ton of meaning from it. So today, we are going to be focusing on the 1990 Chris Columbus film, Home Alone, which was written and produced by John Hughes, starring Macaulay Culkin, Catherine O'Hara, and Joe Pesci. I assume most people watching this are familiar with Home Alone and what it's about, but let me ask you this. What is it really about? What is the main theme of Home Alone? Well, to find it, the first step is to just look at the events of the movie and describe in simplest terms what happens. What is the story? How does it begin? And how does it end? So here's how I would describe what happens in Home Alone. A kid and his mom are mad at each other, then they get separated, and they realize that they miss each other. So while she tries to get home to him, he has to protect his home against invaders. Okay, okay, that was, that was pretty good, but let's make it simpler. So how about a kid defends his home while his mother tries to get home to him? Okay, that's better, but it's still too complicated. Let's break it down even more. So like, Home Alone is about the lengths we will go for our families. Okay, good, good. I think we're almost there, but we can go one step further and make it even simpler. Home Alone is about the importance of family. That's it. We did it. We found the main theme. Whew. Great job, guys. But look, 
Movies don't always just have one theme. There are actually multiple themes here that are all connected. So again, breaking this movie down to a very simple description, it's about an immature kid left on his own and put in a dangerous situation who learns to fend for himself, get over his fears, and defend his family's home. To put that in simplest terms, it's a story about learning to take responsibility. We can do it again. It's a movie about people who end up in a terrible situation because they're mad at each other, and then they realize how much they love each other and go to great lengths to reunite. In simplest terms, it's a story about forgiveness. So basically, Home Alone is about responsibility, forgiveness, and the importance of family. Boom, we did it. See, that's not so hard. And that's how it works for just about every movie. You step back and look at the movie on a macro level. What are the main conflicts? How are they resolved? How do the characters change? And generally, from just answering those questions, you can extract the theme and figure out what the movie is trying to say. Okay, so we've talked about the big picture stuff and how to interpret the story. But the story itself is just a small part of a movie. You can write a story in a few sentences on a piece of paper. What's really important is how it's told. Cinema is a visual medium. If all you care about is the plot, then go read the synopsis on Wikipedia. It's faster. The point of a movie is to tell a story with images. And those images can do a lot more than just showing actors delivering dialogue. Where the camera is placed, how it moves, how a shot uses light and color, how the actors are positioned, these all have a psychological and emotional effect on the audience. Changing any one of those elements can radically affect how we interpret something. These seemingly small choices can create meaning and subtexts that you would not just find in the plot synopsis. So it's time to bust out a fancy French expression. You've probably heard about this one before. It's a big one. It is time to talk about mise-en-scene. Essentially, what mise-en-scene means is what is in the frame. It's the dozens, even hundreds of choices from costumes to locations to lenses to lighting that result in what we see on screen. What we're trying to do here is understand the form, how the tools of cinema are deployed, the film language. It's often been said that a movie teaches us how to watch it. When looking at the early scenes in particular, we're being given clues as to the tone and language of the movie, as in the visual language. If you look at a movie and try to impose the rules of other movies onto it, you're just not having a productive experience. So, for example, back in 2008, when the movie Speed Racer came out, a lot of people looked at it and recoiled in horror. They were like, this looks weird. It's like a cartoon. It doesn't look real. This must be a mistake, which means the movie is bad. Now, the problem with this take is that it's assuming that the movie is trying to look realistic and failing. It's ignoring what is actually going on, which is that the aesthetic was a deliberate choice. And part of analyzing film is treating every aspect of it as a deliberate choice. Now, this is not to say that you have to like every choice, and maybe you think a choice doesn't work and was a mistake. But give the filmmakers some credit. Assume they chose to do it that way, and then figure out why. So this starts with the overall style and aesthetic. A starting point for analyzing this is considering where it falls on the scale of realism versus formalism. Now, without getting into the whole long history of film theory and where these approaches came from, the short version is this. 
One extreme approach to cinema is pure realism, basically a reproduction of reality with no intrusive elements, you know, workers leaving the factory. Then on the other end of the spectrum is like a surreal animated musical, something entirely artificial that doesn't attempt to imitate reality at all. Most movies exist kind of around the middle, in an area called classicism. This uses realist elements like naturalistic performances and locations and subtle, unobtrusive editing to create a linear sense of continuity, but it combines them with formalist elements like a musical score, different camera angles, and camera movement. And classicism is pretty much where Home Alone falls. It has the glossy Hollywood lighting, it's shot on 35mm film, it has the aesthetic and look that we accept as general movie reality. And the sets, costumes, locations, and performances are designed to resemble the real world. But there are also several formalist elements throughout. There's the music, the iconic John Williams score, and several Christmas songs. And then there are the various exaggerated angles, point of view shots, the slow motion when the toboggan flies out the door, this split diopter shot, and of course, the part where Kevin is remembering the mean things his family members said to him, and we see their faces floating at the sides of the frame. And the purpose of all those things that I just listed is the same. It's to show us Kevin's perspective. Any time the film shifts a little bit toward formalism, it's to communicate to the audience how Kevin is feeling and perceiving things. And this brings us to another major component of a film's visual storytelling, perspective. And more specifically, is it a subjective perspective or an objective perspective? I know I just threw out a whole bunch of rhyming words at you, but I promise it's actually pretty simple. When a film uses an objective perspective, it is doing so as if it is an outside observer with no emotional involvement in the story, simply seeing the events from an outside point of view. A subjective perspective is when a film uses its visual language to convey how a character is feeling and telling the story from their perspective. And this can change from scene to scene. So let's look at an example from Home Alone. Early in the movie, when Kevin wakes up after his family has gone to the airport without him, this is all shot from an objective perspective. It's these static, wide shots that emphasize the vast emptiness of the house and how small Kevin looks inside it. Because right now, he doesn't realize that he's home alone. We know more than he does, and so we're standing back as an outside observer, waiting until he notices something is off. And then, as he starts to realize what's happening, the film moves into a subjective perspective. I mean, it literally visualizes his mind as he remembers things his family members said to him, and then the film language changes to express his manic excitement at having the house to himself. We are now firmly in Kevin's perspective for the rest of the movie. But to understand how this perspective is actually done, we need to get a bit more technical. You don't need to know exactly how to make a movie to be qualified to analyze them. You don't need to know how to work a camera or read a light meter. But it does help to have a basic understanding of some of the technical aspects of filmmaking so that you can understand the creative choices being made and what they mean. So, lenses. Those pieces of glass and gears that control how the camera sees the image. We could do a whole class on how lenses work since there is so much to talk about, but we don't have all day. I want to go home and eat dinner after this, so here's the simple version. Every lens has what's called a focal length, which is expressed in a unit of millimeters. Right now, this camera is shooting me on a 35mm lens. A lower number focal length means it's a wider lens, and a higher number means it's a longer lens. 
Every lens has its own qualities, and the choice of lens can radically change what a shot looks like. Here's me on a 16mm lens, and then here's me in the same position on a 105mm lens. In general, longer lenses have a narrower field of view and compress the image, so the background looks closer to the foreground. They also have a shallower depth of field, meaning the part that's in focus. So if a long lens is focused on a person in the foreground, everything behind them will be totally blurry. And because of this, long lenses tend to be used for close-ups, because they isolate the subject in focus and also just make it look more flattering. Wide lenses, on the other hand, capture a much wider field of view, fitting more of the environment into the frame. The depth of field is much deeper, so the out-of-focus parts are not as blurry as they would be with a long lens. And especially with really wide lenses, there's a slight warping to the image. The world looks slightly exaggerated through a wide lens. And so they're often used for comedy. Close-ups with a wide-angle lens can look crazy. And also, wide lenses emphasize motion. So if the camera is moving forward quickly, like if it's strapped to the front of a moving car, the movement looks way faster and more intense with a really wide lens. There's no one correct way to use these lenses. Like, sure, the Coen brothers like to shoot comedies with wide lenses, but then The Revenant was also shot all on super wide lenses. Terrence Malick mostly uses super wide lenses. These are just different choices that affect how the audience interprets the image. And so, how are lenses used in Home Alone? In general, there aren't any really extreme choices. No 11mm lenses and no 1000mm lenses, and definitely no fisheye lenses. Mostly, the lenses stay around 21 to 35mm, relatively wide so that we can see the environment as well as the characters, because obviously the house is very important. What's notable, though, is the way that Chris Columbus and cinematographer Julio Macat use wider lenses. They are almost exclusively used when shooting scenes subjectively from Kevin's perspective. So every time he's looking up at an adult, those adults are shot with a wide-angle lens, which exaggerates the distance, making them look like these huge imposing people towering over Kevin. In the scene in the church, when Kevin finally meets old man Marley, who he's been terrified of for the whole movie, wide-angle lenses make Marley seem huge and scary, and they make Kevin look tiny and weak. But then when Marley sits down and reveals himself to actually be a nice person, the exaggerated wide lenses are replaced with longer lenses, making the characters appear more natural more like humans and less like cartoons. The only times that much longer lenses are used are the scenes when Kevin walks home alone from the grocery store. These lenses isolate him against the background, so he is sharply in focus while the background is totally blurred out. The shots emphasize his isolation. The frame is pretty much empty except for him. And the first time we see this, the camera is higher up, looking slightly down at Kevin, so he appears small. The second time, which comes later in the story, at this point he's feeling better, taking on some responsibility, and so now the camera is placed lower down, looking up at him a little bit, so he appears more confident. Color. It's a vital part of cinema, filling every frame of every movie you see. Except all the black and white ones. Obviously, color is something that just exists in reality, so the camera is going to capture it automatically. But it's also an incredibly powerful storytelling tool. The color of light, of sets and costumes, color manipulation in post-production, all of these things, done deliberately, can affect the audience emotionally and create meaning and subtext within a film. Now, to be clear, there is not only one single meaning for each color. 
Depending on the film, colors can mean pretty much anything. In Star Wars, red is associated with evil, but in other movies it represents passion and love. In The Matrix, green is associated with an oppressive system of control, but in other movies it represents hope and fertility and nature. Colors can be anything. The filmmakers just need to know how and why they're using them. So now, let's talk about the colors in Home Alone. Right from the opening scene, the McAllister house is portrayed in warm colors. It's lit with glowing amber light. It's decorated with lots of reds. Red patterned wallpaper, red bedspreads, red napkins, red leather chairs, and so we associate these colors with home and family. In general, warm colors tend to be appealing and comforting. We associate them with sunsets, autumn leaves, and fireplaces. Human skin is made of warm colors, even for really pale people like me. Most comedies and uplifting movies tend to have warmer color palettes, because this makes us feel good, it puts us at ease, and gets us ready to laugh. Now obviously, there are exceptions. Like Mad Max Fury Road cranks up its warm colors so much that they feel hot and oppressive. But these are generalizations, not science. So if the home in Home Alone has a warm color palette, what happens when we go away from the home? Well, in the whole storyline with Kevin's mom, she is stuck far away, trying to get back home. And every location she and the rest of the family are in has this cold color palette. When she gets on the airplane, before she realizes Kevin isn't there, in each scene, blue becomes more and more dominant. The airports are all blue. The apartment in France is furnished with teal furniture. Even the Christmas tree there is white with blue lights. And yet, Catherine O'Hara, playing Kevin's mom, is always in the warm color palette of their home. She has red hair, she's wearing a camel coat and cream-colored sweater. She clashes with the colors of these environments. This is the movie telling us, with color symbolism, that she doesn't belong here. She's meant to be at home. And this same color coding continues throughout the movie. The Wet Bandit's van is blue. In the opening scene, Harry is disguised as a police officer in a blue uniform. And then, when John Candy shows up to help Kevin's mom get home, he's in a yellow jacket. The warm colors return to help bring her home. This is honestly a pretty well-made movie. Up to now, we've been talking about mise-en-scene, what's in the frame. But now, it's time to talk about the frame itself. If we're going to analyze the visual choices of a film, that doesn't just mean the smaller stuff like lights and lenses. This goes all the way to the top. And by the top, I mean the shape of the movie itself, and by the shape, I mean the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is, simply put, the ratio of the frame's width to its height. In the early days of cinema, all movies were shot and projected pretty much as a square. And then, as technology evolved, wider aspect ratios became available, and these days, pretty much anything is possible depending on what the filmmakers want. So you could have something like the Grand Budapest Hotel, which uses three different aspect ratios. This might seem like a small decision, but it changes the whole way that shots are framed, since the shape of the image is fundamentally different. I know that 2.39 to 1, also known as CinemaScope, has become this shorthand for cinematic, like by throwing black bars on the top and bottom of the movie in editing, it suddenly looks important. But generally, when movies are shot in that aspect ratio, it's a deliberate decision made to utilize the wider frame. Home Alone is shot in the common 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio, which is taller than CinemaScope and is closer to filling a standard 16x9 TV. Now, this aspect ratio is used for all sorts of movies. E.T. and The Godfather used it. But one of the most common uses for it is for comedies. 
comedy movies are often shot with wide lenses. That slight distortion I mentioned earlier can add a comedic undertone to the shots. And since this aspect ratio reveals more of the frame, like we can see more of the characters with the environment around them, it works well for capturing physical comedy. <laughs> I would theorize that while the comedic potential of this aspect ratio is part of why director Chris Columbus chose it, I think the other reason is the same reason it was used for Jurassic Park. See, this aspect ratio is taller. There's more image at the top and bottom. So it was used for Jurassic Park because the dinosaurs are so tall that this allowed the film to capture them better and have them fill more of the frame. And in Home Alone, this extra height to the frame emphasizes how small Kevin is. We see how big the environment is around him, and how huge all the adults seem. Obviously, there's not as much to analyze here compared to, like, color, since it's just one single choice, but I wanted to bring it up to demonstrate that literally every creative choice is worth thinking about. After the camera, maybe the most powerful tool a cinematographer has is lighting. Honestly, the only things you really need to make a movie are a camera and some source of light. Lighting helps create the reality of the film. It gives it mood and atmosphere. It directs our eye and tells us where to look. Most of the time, we're not supposed to notice the lighting. It's meant to establish a cohesive reality that doesn't distract us from the story. But even if we're not noticing the lighting, it's still having an effect on us. Most of Home Alone is lit with what's known as high-key lighting. This essentially means it's very well lit, like I am now. There's a key light, a backlight, probably fill lights too. There are minimal shadows and contrast. It's designed to resemble reality, but like a better looking, more appealing reality, where everyone's face is always nicely lit. This is a fun family comedy with a happy ending, and the high key lighting immediately creates this nice, comforting tone. But on the flip side, some scenes use what's called low-key lighting, which is pretty much the opposite. It often uses only a single light source and has heavy shadows and contrast. It feels more dramatic and suspenseful. So look at this scene, where Harry and Marv are trying to break into the house. They're lit with this single hard light outside. Their faces are partly in shadow, there's lots of darkness, and inside, Kevin is lit only by the dim blue glow of the TV. Suddenly, it feels like there's real danger and stakes. Now, imagine if this scene was lit like this. It would have a totally different feeling, and it really wouldn't feel so dangerous at all. We've already talked about the shape and framing of shots, but the thing is, composition of images isn't really unique to film. These same principles apply to photography and painting and even comic books. But the component that makes cinema unique is movement. In particular, the movement of the camera and the movement of actors within the frame, which is known as blocking. Now, there are movies with no camera movement at all, composed entirely of static shots, like the work of Roy Anderson. But the majority of movies you'll see will have some degree of camera movement. So now, this might seem basic, but I want to run through the different types of camera movement, just so we have a vocabulary we can use. Panning is when the camera turns on the x-axis going right or left. Tilting is when the camera turns on the y-axis going up or down. A zoom is done within the lens, where the camera is fixed to one point, but the focal length is increasing or decreasing. A tracking shot is where the camera moves through space, either on a steady cam or a gimbal or a dolly. A crane shot is when the camera moves through space vertically, and an extension of this is a helicopter or drone shot. 
And handheld, obviously, is when a person is holding the camera, which can add a looser degree of movement to what might otherwise be a static shot. Now, this is not a test to be able to identify exactly how any shot was done. But when you're analyzing a movie, it's helpful to have the vocabulary to be able to discuss the storytelling choices being made and what they're doing. Sometimes this can be as simple as a pan from one thing to another. Like, look at this shot. We're in a wide shot, looking at Kevin from an objective perspective as he is walking home, feeling defeated. And then, the camera pans to show Harry and Marv in a van driving right toward him. This one shot is telling a story. Our main character is unknowingly about to run into, and maybe get run over by, the villains. It's saying, Kevin is at a low point, but uh-oh, Things are about to get worse. And by doing this within one shot, it's telling us where they are in relation to one another within the physical space. Obviously, a lot of the time camera movement is happening to follow the action, moving with characters as they move through the space. But that's still a choice that's being made. Look at the way the camera moves through the airport as Kevin's family rushes to catch their flight. Now this could have been shot objectively in a static wide shot, like from an anonymous person's perspective in the airport watching this crazy family. But by having the camera move with them at the same speed, it's making it subjective, capturing how they're feeling. The opening sequence of the movie is filled with constant movement. The house is full of people rushing around, packing for the trip, and the camera is constantly in motion, usually following characters from one room to the next on a steady cam. Now this serves a few purposes. It's bringing us inside to make us feel like a member of the family. It's creating this frantic energy to contrast the stillness and quiet that will come when Kevin is left home alone. And by using so many wide, long tracking shots, it's teaching the viewer the geography of the house, which will become extremely important as the story goes on. But let's look at a specific example to show how some simple movement of actors and the camera can give a scene meaning and emotion. At one point in the movie, while Kevin is hiding under his parents' bed, he realizes that, since he's the only one there, he needs to toughen up, stop being afraid, and face his problems. So he marches outside to declare to the world that he's not afraid anymore. Now, look at this shot. Kevin starts in the distance, very small in the frame, but as he walks toward us, the camera tracks in at a low angle. Generally, when the camera pushes in like this on a subject, it's telling us that thing is important, as if the camera is interested and is actively getting closer. And so Kevin and the camera move toward each other until we arrive here in what is known as the cowboy shot, a medium shot framing a character from the hips up, usually to make them seem heroic. You can see this in basically any Western, or more recently, this scene in Wonder Woman. So this shot is visualizing Kevin's newfound bravery. He's feeling like a pretty big guy. And then a shadow starts to pass over him and the camera begins moving up. Not tilting up, but actually craning up vertically. We cut to a shot from Kevin's point of view, starting down with Old Man Marley's scary boots, then tilting up the blade of the shovel, which he thinks is a murder weapon. And then it cuts back to Kevin as the camera keeps rising, with Marley's shadow now totally covering him. Immediately, all that bravery is gone, and he is a scared little boy. Even though this cuts back and forth a couple of times, it's really only two shots they're cutting between. So you can see how that movement of the camera pushing in, and then craning up, is telling an entire story without any words. <laughs> 
In general, we're not supposed to notice the editing when watching a movie. It's meant to be invisible, to tell the story clearly with good pacing so we get swept up in it and aren't thinking about the technical aspects or the cuts between the shots. Usually, when we notice editing, it's for disorienting, distracting editing in an action scene, like this thing. What you'll generally encounter in most movies is what's called continuity editing. Editing that establishes a clear sense of spatial geography as well as time. So when you're cutting between people talking, they seem to be looking at each other. The person on the left is looking right, the person on the right is looking left, and each shot chronologically follows the one before it. It feels natural, so we don't even think about it. The basic idea of editing is that when a film cuts from one shot to another, we subconsciously understand the connection between them. So when Home Alone cuts from a TV to Kevin covering his eyes with his fingers, even though they're in separate shots, we understand that he is watching the TV and reacting to it. Especially because at the beginning of the scene, we saw a wide shot that established Kevin and the TV in the same room. Like I said before, movies teach us how to watch them. This same idea applies to situations that don't necessarily have that wide shot to establish the direct connection. So one scene in the film Jaws cuts from a kid calling for his dog on the beach to a close-up of a stick floating in the water. From the context, as in this is a movie about a shark attacking this location, we can infer that the shark ate the dog. We'll miss you, Pippet. R.I.P. to a real one. And sometimes within a scene, the film will suddenly get more abstract and cut to a totally different place. Like in Gladiator, when the film cuts from a close-up of Maximus to this shot of the camera moving toward these big doors. But we understand that this is not literally happening. This is inside Maximus's head. It's what he's seeing as he's dying. Spoilers for the last scene of Gladiator. When this sort of thing is done, it's usually to represent a character's thoughts, their memories, or their imaginations. When a movie shifts its editing style, once again, we just need to observe what it's doing and ask why. The shower scene in Psycho is so legendary, yes, because it's a shocking, violent scene, but it's also this very sudden shift in the movie's visual language. The whole movie up until this point has been told in mostly wide shots and medium shots that are held for a while. And now here, we suddenly have this frantic, rapid cutting with lots of extreme close-ups. It's jarring and chaotic, which is exactly the point of the scene. Look, whole books have been written about editing, like here are a few. And with most movies you see, the editing is clear and effective and mostly invisible. It delivers spatial and temporal continuity like it intends to, and it doesn't really need much analysis. Like Home Alone, the editing by future Scooby-Doo director Raja Gosnell is really effective throughout. It tells the story clearly and engagingly. The pacing is good, the comedy lands, but on its own, it usually isn't providing much additional meaning. It's more that it's clearly delivering the meaning created by the visuals and script. But there are a few examples that I think are worth highlighting. First, there's the montage. We take montages for granted since we've seen a million of them, but consider this. The sequence of Kevin setting up traps around the house, and the reality of the film, that probably took an hour or so. But for us watching the movie, it lasts 1 minute and 10 seconds. We understand that these shots are compressing time. At the beginning of the sequence, we see Kevin's overall plan, and then each successive shot is a small portion of that plan coming together. The bigger piece of editing that I want to highlight is cross-cutting. 
This is when a film cuts back and forth between two or more scenes, which we understand to be happening simultaneously. This is the thing that Christopher Nolan does in all his action scenes, where there are usually a few different storylines happening, and the film keeps cutting between them all. In Home Alone, the film crosscuts between Kevin's family on the plane from Chicago to Paris, and then Kevin waking up alone back home in Chicago. The static wide shots of Kevin at home linger, holding even after Kevin has walked out of the shot, before then cutting to the plane in motion. These cuts feel jarring, and serve to emphasize the massive geographical distance between Kevin and his family that is getting larger by the second. Each time it cuts, the gulf feels greater. And one other thing we must discuss is the crossfade. You know, the transition where one shot blends into the next. Some filmmakers and editors hate them, and yes, they can be lazily used sometimes, but it's still a choice and we should consider what it means. They're most commonly used to show that time is passing, or to create a dreamlike feeling. And here with Home Alone, since we were just talking about the hard, abrupt cuts between the scenes of Kevin and his mom that underline the distance between them, I want to look at another transition from about 15 minutes later in the movie. At this point, Kevin's mom has realized what happened and is actively trying to get home. And now this shot of her in the airport crossfades to this shot of the house. And if you pause it, in the middle of the transition, we're seeing both of them together on screen at the same time. It's creating a visual link, bringing them closer together, even if they're not there quite yet. As much as cinema originally existed only as moving pictures with no audio, sound has come to be an essential part of the medium. It can be just as important to the experience as the visuals. Now we tend to take audio for granted, unless there's some really catchy music or it's something like Tenet where you can't hear the dialogue. Most people don't tend to give the sound of a movie much thought because usually it just feels like the sound that would naturally correspond to the visuals we're seeing, dialogue and sound effects. But it's also a thing that they give out multiple Oscars for every year, so clearly there's a lot there to dig into. Look, I am not saying that when you're analyzing a movie you are required to have a 30 minute discussion focusing only on the audio. A lot of the time, audio is like editing. It does its job invisibly, and you don't pay attention to it. But it's worth being able to understand the choices being made, and how they affect us. When it comes to sound in movies, there are very big obvious examples that you can't help but notice. Like how Atonement blends the diegetic sound effect of the typewriter into the musical score. Or uh, everything David Lynch does. But most of the time, it's simpler and more subtle than that, like in Home Alone. So here, I want to spotlight a few interesting instances of audio choices. Let's go back to the scene we were discussing in the last chapter, where the film is cross-cutting between Kevin waking up alone at home and his family on the plane. Now, pay attention to the sound. I mean, it's kinda hard to miss, but think about what it's doing. The parts with Kevin have barely any sound at all, just the ambient quiet of an empty house. Each individual sound, like the click of a door being opened, stands out clearly against the nothingness. And then, when the film cuts to the plane, It's this massive roar of a jet engine. There's no crossfade between the scenes, it is abrupt and it's jarring, and it creates a distance between the characters just through audio. Every time we hear the airplane, it's telling us that Kevin's family is getting further away by the second. 
they now each exist in totally different sonic landscapes. It's emphasizing Kevin's isolation. Then there is what is known as Foley, which is when sound effects are created in post-production to match what is happening on screen. Things like footsteps, leaves rustling, water pouring, stuff like that. Because the fact is that in real life, the sounds a lot of things make aren't very exciting. They need that extra layer of movie sound to give it the impact the filmmakers want. And one of the major uses of Foley sounds in Home Alone are to once again help create this thing we keep coming back to, Kevin's perspective. Especially when he's scared of things, we've already discussed how the camera work with wide-angle lenses shot from exaggerated angles help create the feeling that we're experiencing this as Kevin is. But the sound is also a major part of that. Listen to the sound of Marley's boots when he steps into the store, with the squeezing of leather and the rattle of the metal buckles. Or the scrape of him dragging the trash can full of salt on the pavement. Or the monstrous roar of the furnace. Listen to this moment without the visuals. Shut up. See, it's still telling the story just through sound. The Foley work is also a key part of the comedic violence in the movie. Again, when Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern are slipping on ice and getting shot with BB guns, we're not usually thinking about the sound. But look closely at the very important needle that it's threading. Here's the part where Marv gets shot in the head with the BB gun. Now, that is absolutely not the sound it would make in real life. The real sound would be more like a pop from the gun, and then we'd probably barely hear him get hit. And so the moment would be less impactful because it wouldn't sound like all that much was really happening. The thing about this, and pretty much all the sounds throughout this sequence, is that they never go full cartoon and break the reality of the film. Like, we're not getting a slide whistle sound effect. The BB gun doesn't make a goofy ricochet sound when it hits Marv. But the sounds are also still exaggerated. The slips on the ice, the hit of the iron, they feel real, but not too real. For comparison, look at this video that Corridor made called R-Rated Home Alone, where they re-edited scenes from the movie and used visual effects to make it, well, R-Rated. Listen to their new sound design for the iron hitting Marv. Even without seeing it, you can tell that's way more brutal. So the sound design is doing a lot of heavy lifting in creating the comedic tone and keeping it within a believable reality. If it strayed too far in one direction, cartoony or realistic, it would break the whole sequence. And then there's the matter of the music. This movie has a score by John Williams, the most famous film composer of the last 50 years. So there's a lot to discuss here. The music in a movie can do a lot. It can create subtext, underline the mood of a scene, express a character's feelings, comment ironically on the story. Look, film music is its own entire field of study. Home Alone has a big, sweeping, classic John Williams score. It's exciting, it's sentimental, and it feels like what we think a Hollywood movie is supposed to sound like. But the score is making some interesting choices, too. This movie is generally thought of as a fun family Christmas comedy, and the first eight seconds of the score have this warm, magical feeling that sound like an early preview of the theme Williams would later write for Harry Potter. But then the music immediately shifts into this eerie, ominous tone. It starts sounding almost like a creepy music box, and then these dark strings and what I think are oboes come in, and it sounds kind of scary. Then sleigh bells come in, signaling the Christmas setting, and the score simultaneously sounds playful, but with these odd atonal string sounds. Looking at just this opening piece, we have some warm sentimentality, some creepy dangerous stuff, 
Christmas, what sounds to me like a nod to Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker, and a light, playful feeling, which is a pretty solid encapsulation of what this movie is. And as soon as we transition out of the titles as the first shot fades up, the music becomes lighter and more upbeat, but it has already signaled to us that some danger lies ahead. The music is a major part of the storytelling here. There's one more thing about the musical score that I would like to mention. Harry and Marv's theme sounds like a deliberate nod to Sergei Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. Like, here's Peter and the Wolf. And here's Home Alone. Go around back down the basement. Come on, follow me. And this isn't just because it sounds good. Prokofiev's original work is telling the story of a young boy on his own who must defend himself against a dangerous attacker. So assuming Williams did this intentionally, and as we've already said, assume everything is intentional, he's drawing a connection to a classic children's story and reframing the film as a continuation of that tradition. Look, I know we say this a lot, but John Williams is very good at this. Okay, so now that we have covered how to interpret the visual language, the editing, the sound and music of a movie, let's put all of these ideas together and look at an actual scene and see what we can interpret from it. Let's start right at the beginning. The very first shot of Home Alone is an exterior shot of the McAllister house at night. What does this shot tell us? Well, first off, it introduces us to the primary setting of the film, since most of the story takes place in that house. And secondly, it establishes that it's Christmas. Also, consider the perspective of the shot. It's being filmed straight on at eye level from across the street, as if from the perspective of an outside observer. It is an objective perspective. Then the very next shot brings us inside, but it's shot right from the doorway, as if we've stepped through the front door. In the foreground, we see this police officer who, based on the uniform, clearly doesn't live there. So we're now seeing things from his perspective, an outsider who has entered this home and is observing what's happening within. And then each successive shot takes us deeper into the house with the family that lives there dominating more of the frame. Essentially, the film is welcoming us inside, as we go from an outsider looking in to being immersed in the home and the family. Now in this next part, we're introduced to Kevin McAllister, the main character of the movie. It's always good to pay close attention to how a movie introduces its characters. This scene starts by focusing on his mother, Kate, as the camera follows her, dollying from a medium shot to a wide. And then, pause it here, Kevin enters in the background. He looks tiny in the frame and is at the very edge of the shot. His mom doesn't even react as he enters. So let's analyze this shot. What is the mise-en-scene telling us? Well, he is, quite literally, in the background, he's being overlooked and ignored by his family. If we generally assume that the most important thing is in the center of the frame, he is clearly less important. He's a nuisance. But then he enters the scene, hops on the bed, and moves from the background into a close-up in the foreground. And here is where the movie shifts. Now, the perspective changes. We are no longer seeing the story as an impartial observer. We are now seeing it from Kevin's perspective. So look at the placement of the camera over the next few scenes. It always stays at Kevin's eye level. So we see the world as he does. When characters talk to him, they are filmed from a low angle, so they're towering over the camera, looking down at us. The most obvious instance comes in this scene in the kitchen, when Kevin causes a big old mess and everyone gets mad at him. And here, the film switches over completely to a point of view shot. The camera is now Kevin's eyes, and so now, suddenly everyone is looking directly into the camera. 
This is something that movies generally avoid. When an actor looks at the camera, it's breaking the fourth wall that exists between the reality of the movie and our reality looking in, which can sometimes be used deliberately, like when Eddie Murphy does it in this scene in Trading Places. Bacon, which you might find in a bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich. There's something jarring and usually sort of uncomfortable about it. Suddenly, the characters aren't looking at each other, they're looking at us. We feel sort of exposed, like the safety of being an invisible observer is gone. This is something that Jonathan Demme used deliberately for years, like in The Silence of the Lambs, where he has all these conversations shot in close-ups with the actors looking right down the barrel of the camera. It's uncomfortable, and it's supposed to be. And that's what Home Alone is doing here. Suddenly, everyone is staring right at us. We feel like Kevin feels, like we're the center of attention, and not for a good reason. And we haven't noticed it up to this point, but through this whole sequence, there is just this general ambient noise happening of just all the chaos and people running around and talking within the house. And right here, all of that background ambient sound cuts out. There is silence, and that helps emphasize how uncomfortable this moment is. Now that we've spent the past, like, hour talking about how to actually interpret meaning from a film, what do we do with that? Well, this is the fun part. This is where we choose what lens we want to use to discuss the movie. And I'm not talking about camera lenses here. This basically means what context we want to look at the film in. Within the fields of film theory and literary theory, there are a lot of different lenses and theories you can apply. But for now, I just want to bring up a few. Okay, we need to talk about a controversial topic here called auteur theory, or auteur theory, or however you want to pronounce it. Auteur theory is an aspect of film studies that began with writers like Francois Truffaut and André Bazin writing for Le Cahier du Cinéma in the 1950s, and then in the 60s, American film writer Andrew Sarris actually gave it a name in his essay, Notes on the Auteur Theory. Some people will be like, screw auteur theory, it's just a pretentious way of deifying a bunch of old white guy directors and justifying egomaniacal behavior. And yeah, I understand what you mean. But like it or not, auteur theory has become so baked into how people talk about film that you can't ignore it. And while I think there are bad readings of auteur theory, I don't think it's inherently bad. So what exactly is it? In simplest terms, auteur theory is about assigning a primary author to a film, generally the director, and looking at the film in the context of their body of work. The idea is that an auteur injects their own personality, worldview, and style into their work. Give the same script to, like, Alfred Hitchcock or Stanley Donen, and you'll get very different films. But here's the thing. The auteur does not necessarily have to be the director. In fact, you can even apply auteur theory to multiple people within a given film. It could be an actor. Like, I would argue the primary auteur of the Mission Impossible franchise is Tom Cruise. By selecting the directors and having a huge amount of input on all the stories and major creative decisions, his is the primary vision shaping the series. The auteur of much of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Marvel itself. In other words, Kevin Feige. And like in that case, sometimes the producer is the auteur, like David O. Selznick and Gone with the Wind. I don't think the point of auteur theory is to treat the director like a god and attribute every single creative decision made during the production to them. The point is really just to provide a context through which to examine the film. It is looking at the film within their larger body of work to find recurring themes and ideas and stylistic elements that show an artist with a distinct perspective. 
And I do think it can be a really useful and also fun lens through which to discuss movies. And this requires keeping a couple things in mind. Number one, the studio. Like it or not, film is a commercial art, and sometimes the studio that's funding the movie will override the director in regards to certain choices. And two, film is a collaborative medium. Even if the director is the boss, and their vision for the film is what everyone is trying to realize, you've still got a huge cast and crew with everyone making choices and bringing their own perspectives to the work. Ignoring that, and the impact made by each person, is just cutting off fascinating aspects worth exploring. Like yeah, George Lucas was the auteur of Star Wars, and made the decision to hire John Williams. But are we really gonna credit Lucas for all of Williams' music? Williams is no tour in his own way, who radically impacted just about every film he worked on. Which brings us, finally, back to Home Alone, which features a score by John Williams. Home Alone is actually a fascinating example, because here, the auteur theory can be applied to multiple people, and the biggest one is not actually the director. So I'm sorry, Chris Columbus, but we're talking about John Hughes here, the writer and producer. Home Alone came at the end of an incredibly busy decade for Hughes, in which he wrote more than 10 hit movies, and there are a lot of recurring elements across those films. Home Alone, like almost every Hughes production, is set in the suburbs of Chicago. It involves a large dysfunctional family, like in the vacation movies, one family member feeling neglected, like in Sixteen Candles, and people desperately trying to get home for a holiday, like in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And it also represents a shift in his interests. After Home Alone, he would write several movies featuring villainous criminals, such as Career Opportunities, Baby's Day Out, and Dennis the Menace. And most notably, after Home Alone, Hughes would spend the rest of his career primarily writing PG-rated family films instead of the movies for adults and teenagers he had focused on for the previous decade. That said, we can do the same thing with director Chris Columbus. Before this, he had written the screenplays for Gremlins, about young people having to deal with a dangerous situation at Christmas time, and The Goonies, about kids facing off against a gang of criminals. And you could draw a straight line between Home Alone and the first Harry Potter film, which Columbus again largely shoots from a child's perspective who is overwhelmed by this huge world around him. So remember, auteur theory isn't actually so bad if you do it the right way. Every movie ever made is, in some way, a small part of film history. These movies don't exist in a void. They exist in conversation with other movies. Movies before it, movies contemporaneous with it, and movies that came after. Look, every movie, no matter how original, is influenced by other movies. And when analyzing a movie, it's helpful to be aware of this. This isn't a matter of treating the movies like Easter egg hunts, the way some people do for Quentin Tarantino movies, trying to find the original source for every shot. This is about trying to better understand the thought process of the filmmakers, what their influences were, and how they used them. It's helpful to look at where certain elements came from and how they might have changed. In Home Alone, there are a handful of fairly overt, deliberate film references. The old gangster movie Kevin watches, Angels with Filthy Souls, is a reference to the 1938 crime movie Angels with Dirty Faces. This shot of Harry and Marv's shadows looks like an homage to the shot in Nosferatu of the vampire's shadow moving up the stairs. Harry getting his hand burned, plunging it in the snow, and getting his palm branded is modeled on a similar moment in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The M on his hand is also a nod to the movie poster for Fritz Long's classic film M. 
But then there are the deeper film connections, like the similarities it has to Sam Peckinpah's 1971 violent psychological thriller Straw Dogs, which also features a climactic sequence in which the protagonist rigs a house with traps to fight off intruders. This is something that would appear again in the 2012 James Bond movie Skyfall. Or there's the premise in which a physically outmatched hero is trapped alone in a building and must fight off a band of thieves in order to reunite with his family at Christmas is pretty much the same as Die Hard, which was released two years earlier. The point of this is not to accuse movies of ripping off one another. It's that these films are in conversation with each other, sometimes deliberately. Like, according to Home Alone's production designer, on the set of the movie, they were well aware of the Straw Dog similarities. But even if not deliberately, it's worth exploring and comparing how different movies explore similar ideas. Another angle you could explore is Home Alone's physical comedy and its roots in silent film. You could write a whole essay on the evolution of slapstick pratfalls, from Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton all the way up through Home Alone. This is why one of the most important aspects of analyzing movies is to just watch a lot of movies. Because the deeper your knowledge gets, the more patterns and trends and influences become apparent. You can understand something better when you know where it came from. Which brings us to genre. On one level, genre doesn't matter all that much. It's essentially a system for categorizing movies based on a collection of elements and tropes, mostly to make it easier for people browsing Netflix, or in the good old days, the video rental store. Like, the label of the genre, drama, is applied to basically anything that doesn't fit into another genre. If it's not comedy or horror or sci-fi or fantasy, and it features, like, adults having conversations, then it must be a drama, whatever that means. Genre is mostly about audience expectations. The genre is extremely important when marketing a movie, because by selling it as a specific genre, it's telling the audience what to expect since decades of watching movies has conditioned us to expect certain things from certain genres. So sometimes you have a case like Darren Aronofsky's 2017 film Mother, which was marketed as a horror movie. So people went to see it expecting a horror movie. And then it turned out to be sort of an allegorical art film that's like a darkly funny surreal thriller. And so when opening weekend audiences were surveyed by the polling company CinemaScore, they gave it an F. And it's not that the movie is bad. It's that it wasn't what audiences expected it to be. They were led to believe it belonged to a genre and were disappointed when it didn't meet the expectations of that genre. Genre is another filmmaking tool. Because we've seen a lot of movies during our lives, we immediately associate genres with specific images or sounds or locations. Within a film, filmmakers can use the language of different genres to quickly communicate certain feelings. So how does this apply to Home Alone? Well, above all else, this movie is a comedy. You can tell right from the first scene, the film is shot with bright, warm lighting, it's flattering to the actors, the scene looks inviting, it puts us at ease, making us happy, which is conducive to laughing. If the movie was shot like a David Fincher film, with a desaturated bluish color palette and heavy shadows, but still had the same performances and dialogue, we'd be confused. The different aspects of the film would be working against each other. Now, even though I just said that wouldn't work, something similar is actually done pretty effectively in the movie Game Night, which is a comedy shot like a thriller, so as to make the genuine danger and stakes of the movie feel more real. But also, this visual style is part of the comedic design of the movie, since for a long time, the characters in it don't realize they're actually in a thriller. Anyway, back to Home Alone. So even though most of the movie looks like how we expect a comedy to look, it occasionally borrows from another genre, horror. 
Throughout the film, some scenes will borrow visual language and sound design from horror movies. Old Man Marley looks scary. The sound of his shovel scraping the ice on the sidewalk is creepy. The furnace in the basement looks and sounds like a monster. So again, let's follow the usual strategy. Now that we've observed what is happening in the film, we have to ask, why? Why is Chris Columbus choosing to play these scenes like a horror movie inside his wacky family comedy? Because, as I've said repeatedly throughout this video, the film wants to put us in Kevin's perspective and communicate how he's feeling. He's eight years old. He's young and immature and scared of a lot of things. We as adults know that these things aren't really dangerous. That's just an old man. That's just a furnace. But this is Kevin's story, and the most effective way to make us empathize with him and show what he's scared of is to portray these things with the filmmaking language of the horror genre. But that said, part of the fun of analyzing art is that there are an infinite number of ways you can interpret it. Remember back at the start when we talked about how the main themes of Home Alone are responsibility, forgiveness, and the importance of family? Now these are the most obvious commonly accepted themes. They're probably what Chris Columbus and John Hughes would tell you the movie is about. But let's dig a little deeper and get a little weirder and see what else we can find. Okay, so what if we want to look at Home Alone through a lens of gender studies and queer theory? Again, we start by just looking at what's there, but this time we're focusing on certain aspects of the story. If we do this, we can see that at the beginning, Kevin is confused about whether he wants to get married or live alone when he grows up. For much of the movie, he is intimidated by women who are more powerful than him, especially his mother. And in the end, he eventually is able to find salvation by connecting with an older man who eventually saves his life. So you could theoretically argue that this is a story about a young person's struggle to figure out their sexuality. Okay, look, I really don't think that's it, but for instance, you could apply that same lens to Harry and Marv's relationship. I'm pretty sure there's a valid queer reading of that. But here's another reading. The kind older man that Kevin befriends, this happens in a church. And that man with his long white beard matches the popular Christian depiction of God. And earlier in the film, Kevin escapes danger by hiding among the figures in a nativity scene, by becoming a witness to the birth of Christ. And of course, the whole movie is set at Christmas. So one way to interpret it is that Home Alone is a movie about finding salvation in God and Christianity. But wait, there are more. It could also be about class warfare in America, with Kevin McAllister, a privileged upper-class kid threatened by two poor working-class men who travel around in a symbol of blue-collar America, a van for a plumbing and heating company. Okay, look. Do I really think that all of these are really what the movie is about? No. But any of them could potentially be valid interpretations if you can provide enough evidence within the film to argue it persuasively. And all of this comes down to simply observing what you see and what happens in the film, breaking it down in simplest terms, then asking why. What does this mean? The thing about analyzing movies, and this really goes for analyzing art in general, is that even though we have all these fancy pre-existing lenses that various scholars came up with over the years, we're all going to interpret things slightly differently. Because every time we watch a movie, we are bringing with us not just our existing taste in movies and the knowledge of all the movies we've ever seen, but also our own personal experiences, our cultural background, and inner emotional life. And all of those things affect how we feel about a movie. The only wrong way to analyze a movie is to insist that your way is the only way. 
Remember, this is all just a matter of observing what you're experiencing, even if that means observing your own reaction and asking why. After all, art can be a great way to learn more about yourself. Look, Home Alone is not an especially deep movie. This is not a piece of arthouse cinema. It's an extremely mainstream family movie, best known for Joe Pesci getting shot in the nuts with a BB gun. But the whole point of this video is to show that any movie is worth studying and analyzing and finding meaning in, not just serious art films. And you don't have to do this with everything you watch. That would get exhausting. If you want to just watch a movie for fun without thinking too deeply about it, go for it. I do it all the time too. But the meaning is always there if you want to look for it. Even if the people who made the movie didn't intend all that meaning to be there, it's still there. You just have to find it. And so now, go forth, re-examine all your favorite movies, and impress people at parties by telling them how Home Alone is really about class warfare and finding salvation in God and stuff like that. It's a great way to make new friends. Trust me. Oh, okay, welcome back, and thank you for sticking with me through this whole thing that was a bit more, like, fully academic than the regular videos usually are. So, I mentioned at the start that this video was originally written as a class for Nebula, before I changed my plan and made a different class instead. Well, if you enjoyed this class, I have a whole other one on Nebula right now. It is 80 minutes long, an entire feature-length class, on how to make a movie. Like, sure, you can join Masterclass and watch Ron Howard's class on filmmaking. It's pretty good. I've seen it. But his class also assumes that you have a budget and a crew, and so it isn't entirely relatable for people doing no-budget filmmaking. But you know whose class is all about making a movie with little to no budget and how to actually get it finished? Mine is. Oh, and if you would actually like to watch the micro-budget feature film I released last year, Night of the Coconut, it is also available exclusively on Nebula. And so are all the bonus features that we recently released, like three different commentary tracks featuring the cast and crew, and an extended scene featuring even more surprise cameos than in the actual movie. See, Nebula is a platform built by a bunch of creators like me to give us a place to experiment and make different, more ambitious projects than we do on YouTube. It's a place where I can make a feature-length narrative film, where you can watch jet lag episodes early. It's the only place Lindsay Ellis is releasing new videos. It's the place with dozens of classes taught by your favorite creators. And yes, I am finally working on my next narrative short film, which will premiere exclusively on Nebula. Nebula is the best place to watch my videos, there are no ads, there is so much great new exclusive stuff coming out all the time, and if you join, you are supporting this community of independent creators and helping make it possible for us to keep growing and expanding the scope of what we do. I'm sorry, but I am legitimately passionate about this. So if you sign up for Nebula at the link below, down there in the description, you can get it for just over $3 a month, which honestly is a pretty great deal for something that's pretty great. Okay, that is all for now. Good night. All right, I guess it's still daytime, but uh, bye. Hello, it's me one more time. I feel like this is turning into a Russian nesting doll of segments where I talk to the camera, but I'm here because I want to let you know something very important, which is that the vinyl Night of the Coconut soundtracks produced by Mondo are in stock and shipping now, if you want one, because um, if I'm being honest, I think these are pretty much the coolest thing that has ever come from these videos and this channel. Uh, I mean, we have this incredible, gorgeous artwork by Colin Murdoch. Uh, the obviously amazing music by Brian Metolius, featuring on vocals Chloe Holgate and Matt Torpy. And um, I just think it's so cool that these exist. And, uh, and I love them so much. Uh, the, the special editions are available from the Nebula merch store. Those have the yellow vinyl, and all of them are signed 
by Brian and myself. Uh, and then the regular editions, uh, featuring brown coconut vinyl, um, are available from the Mondo store. So you can get whichever one you want, or both, but that seems like overkill. Um, anyway, I just want to let you know, because I love these so much, I'm so thrilled that this happened, and, uh, and that's all. So, you know, whether you're an avid vinyl collector, or maybe you don't even have a record player, but you just want this on display as a cool piece of art in your home, um, you know, it works for everybody. Great gift as well. Okay, I'm shilling too much now. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that for those of you who are following along with the topic tournament of 2023, the big tournament to decide which fan submitted video topic would get turned into a real video, um, Muppet Cinema won. And so by the end of the year, I will make and release a video about Muppets and movies. I think it's going to be great. So that's all. There's a lot to get excited about. Um, I got to go work on the next video. The, the stuff we have coming up, I think is going to be really fun. Anyway, that's, that's enough of me talking. Goodbye. <laughs>